60 Minutes Rewind. President Bush says the United States can't leave Iraq until the country can govern and defend itself. Right now, a number of inconvenient facts suggest it can do neither. Everyone knows about the deteriorating security situation, but very little has been reported about the rampant corruption that has infected a succession of Iraqi regimes. Earlier this year, Iraqi investigators told us that at least a half a billion dollars that was supposed to equip the new Iraqi military was stolen by the very people the U.S. had entrusted to run it. It's been called one of the biggest thefts in history, the mother of all heists, and it happened right under the noses of U.S. advisors. But neither the United States nor its allies have much of an appetite for pursuing it. People have died. Monies have gone missing. Culprits are running around the world, hiding and scurrying around. I have to ask myself, why has this happened? It is not every day that you get billion-dollar scandals of this kind. When Ali Alawi, a Harvard-educated international banker, took over as Iraq's Minister of Finance last year, he was confronted with a gaping hole in the Treasury. $1.2 billion had been withdrawn by the new Ministry of Defense to supply the Iraqi army with desperately needed equipment to fight the growing insurgency. Millions had been misspent on old and antiquated equipment, and Alawi says most of the money simply disappeared. How much do you think was stolen? I think this, the figure is probably between seven fifty eight hundred million dollars. It's a lot of money. It is a huge amount of money by any standard, by by even by U.S. standards. It's one of the biggest thefts in history, I think. Gone. Gone. Yes, up in the smoke. The story begins in June two thousand and four when presidential envoy Paul Bremer turned over authority to the interim Iraqi government, which would run the country until elections could be held. The insurgency was already gaining momentum, and with the newly constituted Iraqi army riding into battle in unarmored pickup trucks and scrounging for guns and ammunition, the Iraqi defense ministry went on a billion dollar buying spree with almost no oversight. The contracts were paid in advance with no guarantees, and most of them involved a single company. They were awarded without any bidding to a company that was established a few months prior with a total capital of uh, $2,000. So you had nearly a billion dollars worth of contracts awarded to a company that was just uh, a paper company, whose directors had nothing to do with the Ministry of Defense or with the government of Iraq. The name of that company was Elaine al Jaria, which in Arabic means the ever-flowing spring. Its address here in Amman, Jordan, was a post office box, its telephone number, a mobile phone. The principal was a mysterious Iraqi by the name of Nair Jumeli, and a half a billion dollars in Iraqi defense funds would eventually find their way into his private account at the Housing Bank of Jordan. The exact whereabouts of that money and the whereabouts of Mr. Jumeli are presently unknown. The person who knows the most about the case, in fact, the only person who seems to be investigating it, is Judge Roddy Al Roddy, Iraq's Commissioner of Public Integrity. It's his job to prosecute official corruption in Iraq, and it may be the most dangerous job in the country. Twice tortured and imprisoned under Saddam Hussein, he now receives death threats from both the insurgents and from corrupt officials. Seven of his people have been killed. Do you have bodyguards? No. Yes. How many? Thirty. Thirty. Lots of people would like to see you dead. I don't care. That's their problem. You don't care? I do not care. Judge Roddy was more than happy to walk us through the case. Aside from the hundreds of millions of dollars that were stolen, Roddy says much of the equipment actually delivered to the Iraqi military was useless junk. Soviet-era helicopters, some of which were considered unfit to fly, bulletproof vests that fell apart after a few weeks, and a shipment of ammunition so old one of the people inspecting it feared it might blow up. Instead of aircraft, we receive mobile hospitals. What would an army without aircraft do with mobile hospitals? Instead of getting planes and tanks and vehicles and weapons that we needed, we got materials there really was not a big need for. In October 2005, Judge Roddy obtained arrest warrants for some of the top officials in the Ministry of Defense, and almost all of them fled the country, 
including former Defense Minister Hazem Shalon, who is believed to be in Europe or the Middle East. We did manage to locate one of his top deputies, Ziad Katan, who is in charge of military procurement. We found him in Paris, happy to be there, and not terribly concerned. There is an arrest warrant out for you. Yes, I hear about that. If you went back to Baghdad, you'd be arrested. Uh, no, nobody will arrest me. They will kill me. <laughs> the son of a retired Iraqi general, Katan had been living in Poland until a few days before the U.S. invasion, running a pizza parlor in Germany and importing and exporting used cars. But his can-do attitude and ability to speak English impressed the Americans, including Ambassador Bremer, who praised Katan in his memoir. After a few months working with the coalition on neighborhood councils, Katan was given a position in the new Ministry of Defense. So you were recruited for this job? Yes. By the CPA? Yes. By Ambassador Bremer and his aides? His staff, yeah. Did you have any experience in military procurement? No. To make up for this obvious deficiency, Katan was sent off to the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. for a few weeks of training and eventually placed in charge of buying $1.2 billion worth of equipment for the Iraqi military. The allegations are that $1.2 billion left Iraq yes. to buy military equipment. Yes. And only about $400 million worth of equipment came back into the country and that $800 million somehow disappeared. It is true. Katan told us that the charges are politically motivated and that he can account for every single dinar. All equipment with this one billion, 200 million, it is nowadays in Iraq. It was delivered to I Iraq. I have documentation, I give it to you in your hand. Well, this is a big misunderstanding. I mean, we're talking about 800 million dollars. Yes, it is here. I can show you. This is BTR, this is BTR 80 from Hungarian. This is uh, ambulances, 2005 production, also in Iraq nowadays. This is mobile kitchen, also in Iraq nowadays. Well, and this is an equipment, this is just pictures of it. Yeah, but it, you can prove it if you want to do. Nobody wants to approve it, that's the problem. The story will continue after this. We took all of Catan's documentation, had it translated into English, and gave it to Jane's, one of the world's leading authorities on military hardware. John Kenkel, the senior director of consulting, advises countries on military purchases. If you had $1.2 billion and you were going to equip the Iraqi army, would you have bought what they bought? Well, that's the big question, was nobody really knows what they bought. Kenkel told us the documents were so vague that he couldn't tell what had been ordered or whether it had been delivered. I think the biggest thing was that you couldn't identify what the equipment was that was actually being delivered. To say that you were being delivered a, a gun um, doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of what you're getting. Can you think of another government in the world that would have spent $1.2 billion this way on military equipment? Uh, <laughs> nobody that uh, um, I think would, would you would consider on the up and up. But the thing that really suggests this wasn't on the up and up are these audio recordings, which we obtained from a former associate of Ziad Katan and the mysterious middleman Nair Jamali. We have some audio recordings we'd like you to listen to. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Ziad Katan, Deputy Secretary General, Minister of Defense. Is that your voice? Yes. So I just talked with him. I am the recordings were made by the associate as he drove Katan around Amman in 2004. According to two independent translations, they're talking about payoffs to Iraqi officials. This is Katan talking about a top political advisor to the defense minister, a man who was also identified on the recordings as a representative of the president and the prime minister of the interim government. He wants to know. He wants to know how much they are going to place in his account? Yes, of course. How much? Forty-five million. He wants to know how much money is going to be placed in his account. He, you he say won't... forty-five million? Yes, but not dollar. I don't say dollar. And what was it? Forty-five million what? I don't remember. Well, you're going to give him forty-five million of something. Yes, but I don't remember what the matter was. 
Catan told us that U.S. and coalition advisors at the Ministry of Defense approved everything that he did, and he now believes that the recordings have been doctored. The audio experts that we consulted could find no evidence of it. Judge Roddy told us that he too has a copy of the recordings and that one former Ministry of Defense employee confessed after hearing them. How could the American advisors have missed all of this? I think this question should be directed to the Americans. We certainly tried to, but no one in the U.S. government would talk to us on camera about the missing $800 million. Off camera, we were told that this was Iraqi money spent by a sovereign Iraqi government and therefore the Iraqis' business. So where did all the money go to? It's impossible to tell. The money trail disappears inside a number of Middle Eastern banks. We can report that Ziad Qatan, who was recently convicted in absentia in Iraq and sentenced to 60 years for squandering public funds, is building this villa for himself in Poland. And Nair Jamali, who is wanted by Interpol, is said to be snapping up real estate in Amman and building himself a villa. A lot of these suspects are living outside of Iraq and comfort and don't seem to be too concerned about the charges against them. As you know, those people, they have a lot of money right now, so they use it to bribe anybody in the world. How much help have you gotten from countries like Poland and Jordan in either apprehending suspects or recovering money? No help at all. We have not been given any serious uh, official support from either the United States or the UK or uh, any of the surrounding Arab countries. Why has this received so little attention, do you think? The only explanation I can come up with is that too many people in positions of power and authority in the new Iraq have been, in one way or another, found with their hands inside the cookie jar. And if they are brought to trial, it will cast a very disparaging light on those people who had supported them and brought them to this position of power and authority. Nobody wants to get to the bottom of it. In practice, no. Alawi left his post earlier this year when the new government was formed, but Judge Roddy is still there. Along with having one of the most dangerous jobs in Iraq, he also has one of the heaviest workloads. His investigators have opened 2,000 corruption cases involving 21 different ministries and $7.5 billion. The former minister of electricity has been convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. And more than a dozen other former ministers and top officials are wanted for arrest. Oil smuggling is costing the Iraqi government billions of dollars a year. And according to one estimate, 40 to 50% of the profits are going to the insurgents.